Awesome. Thank okay. you. Thanks so much. Okay, I'm going to take us in a totally different direction, uh, back to history. But um, uh, hi, everyone. My name is Evan Fernandez. Um, I am a PhD student in Latin American history in Berkeley, California, and I'll be here in Chile doing research for my dissertation under the Fulbright Hayes DDRA program. And after so much back and forth on WhatsApp, it's just nice to meet all of you, and uh, I, I appreciate you listening. Uh, what I think I'll do is I'm going to describe a little bit about uh, my, my dissertation project and then a little bit about uh, the institutions where I'll be working, uh, mostly in Santiago. And I've got some notes which will hopefully help contain myself to uh, uh, 10 or so minutes and then I'm happy to chat. Uh, so to begin about my own research, my dissertation is about Latin America's place in the Pacific Ocean. Uh, I'm sure, as you all know, though colonized by European empires and much better known for their transatlantic geopolitical and commercial relationships with powerful states in the Atlantic, Latin Americans have also maintained really important relationships with people and states surrounding the Pacific Ocean. My dissertation takes a, as a slice a case study of Latin America and the Pacific by looking at uh, Chile and the Chilean nitrate fertilizer industry. Uh, so as many of you may, may know, um, Chilean nitrate, also known as saltpeter or salitre in Spanish, was Chile's uh, most important export good and largest export good from probably the mid-1800s or so to the early 1900s. And farmers literally all across the world relied on Chilean fertilizer uh, to grow their crops. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the way, so, so the way that nitrate is produced, it comes from the deserts in the north, which we've talked about a little bit. Basically, you blast ore from underground deposits, and then it's sent into a long process of refinement, at the end of which it's turned into a white powder, which is how it's bagged and shipped, and then used and, and, and applied in agriculture. And so Chilean nitrate, it's a very potent form of nitrogen, so the way it works in agriculture, super generalization is that uh, you can insert nit uh, nitrogen into crops and allow soils to, to grow crops with that nitrogen without having to rely on the natural nitrogen supply uh, of plants, nitrogen cycle of plants. So starting in the late 1800s, Chilean nitrate fertilizer goes all over the world and basically enables the final stages of global industrialization by allowing modernizing countries with booming populations to feed their populations from exhausted soils and also to produce goods that they then export for profit. So right at the center of global history there is Chilean fertilizer. Um, so my research uh, with that established is to take a, a case study in this and I look at how the Chilean nitrate industry in the first half of the 20th century tried to reorient all of its focus to Japan and Asia, and how various Chilean businessmen and diplomats worked with their counterparts in Japan to turn this idea or this vision of Japanese markets to life uh, as the traditional markets for nitrogen in Europe and the US started to evaporate in the early 1900s for a number of reasons. Uh, to give just a sense of the timeline, my, my dissertation looks at how between the 1890s and the 1940s, a number of Chilean and Japanese actors together acknowledged their mutual interests in, in agriculture, in commerce, and labor, and believed that they could be partners in, in the Pacific Ocean, a region which up to the 20th century had had significant but somewhat sporadic relationships between uh, Latin American and Asian states. This started in 1897, I have the date there, when Chile and Japan first signed a treaty. It was a commercial treaty intended to develop Japanese consumption of nitrate fertilizer. Uh, and so beginning in the late 1890s and the decades thereafter, Chilean businessmen um, worked to build the, log the logistical infrastructure that would open Japan to become a, a massive consumer of Chilean fertilizer. And the idea was that first Japan and then all of Asia had massive uh, very dense agrarian populations and, there could, and therefore could be uh, a vast and completely untapped consumer base for uh, Chile's primary industry. Uh, as, as, this, as the infrastructure, this commercial infrastructure started to emerge by the 1920s and 30s, 
uh, actors in both states also started to oversee the limited immigration of Japanese laborers to Chile to work in the nitrate industry because at this time there were pretty severe labor shortages in Chile and pretty excessive labor surpluses in Japan. So there was a mutual compatibility uh, in, in a labor situation there. Uh, by this point in the 1920s, 1930s, there's a pretty robust infrastructure finally for the carrying of nitrate across the Pacific. Um, but unfortunately, war arrived to the Pacific with World War II by the late 1930s and early 1940s and ultimately severed this Pacific uh, commodity chain when Chile declared war with Japan in 1943. So my dissertation looks at how between the 1890s and the 1940s, you see the gradual rise and then rapid collapse of this vision for uh, the future of what Ch uh, Chile's uh, uh, national industry could be. Uh, as I'll say a little bit later, it never reached the quantitative scope that actors envisioned, but there's a huge uh, documentary record of Chilean businessmen for decades who truly forecasted incomprehensible profits for this Chilean industry if only they could find a way to crack the, the riddle of geographic distance and um, cultural differences and language barriers. So while it doesn't sound that interesting, I study the, the Chilean and Japanese businessmen who tried to work through these logistical problems. Um, and then on the Japanese side, uh, the idea was that their, their population was ex uh, rapidly expanding and they needed, they desperately needed fertilizer. So there was incentive on the Japan, from, from Japanese firms to, to, in, to import fertilizer for their own national sustenance and for agribusiness. So I looked at, so I look at these mutual compatibilities and how actors went about um, building this, this nitrate chain. Um, so that's, that's the broad, very broad strokes of my dissertation. I'm happy to talk more about it. And, you know, we've all been joking about the kind of nerdiness of our projects. And, like, <laughs> saying you study historical fertilizers <laughs> doesn't really give me, give me uh, stories for parties. But it's, 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 a, it's a critical component of global history, and it's a way of seeing Chile at the center of global history. And I'm hoping that this will, that looking at Chile, looking at Latin American history from the vantage point of the Pacific, I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but within the historical discipline, that's, that's part of a profound conversation taking place that can hopefully help us understand more about the development of capitalism and labor systems. So I hope that this dissertation will have something to say about that. Um, okay, let me say a little bit about the institutions where I'll be working. So in, in, in the field of history, our main methodology is documentary research. So I work in document archives. It, it sounds crude to say, but like the running joke is that we read dead people's mail. So I basically read the mail of Japanese and Chilean diplomats and businessmen and, and their correspondence. And I'll primarily be working in Santiago at the multiple branches of the National Archives, as well as the archives of the Chilean Foreign Ministry, also in Santiago. And I'm really grateful to the Fulbright also that it'll allow me to travel to a few branches of the National Archives in Northern Chile. Um, and I'll say I've done, I've done a lot of archival research in numerous countries, and Santiago has some of the best preservation and accessibility practices I've ever seen. So it really is a pleasure to work here, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, okay, I'm going to finish with just a couple minutes um, on an image. Wanted, you've heard me ramble about fertilizers and archives, so I wanted to switch to this and I'll conclude with this. Um, this is an advertisement for Chilean nitrate um, for, uh, directed at Japan from the early 1950s that was produced by a British firm which became the primary carrier for nitrate to Japan after the Second World War. Um, I'm cheating a little bit by inserting this because I don't speak Japanese and the vast majority of the research is in Spanish, but I wanted to show it because this is an incredibly visually striking image and the Chilean nitrate firms produced dozens and dozens and dozens of these in every language and sent them all over the world. This was their primary uh, marketing material and they're all as artistic and visually striking as this one. Um, they, there's a room with some of these on display at the Museum of National History um, in the Plaza de Armas. 
I would be delighted to go with any of you. I will take zero convincing to go if you want to see it. But um, this one is from Japan, and uh, I show it because it it's, it's it illustrates some of the some of the documentary evidence that I work with, but also because it touches on a core argument of my dissertation, which comes out of looking at decades of sources like these, which is how Chileans and Japanese self-consciously positioned themselves uh, against each other and in the world by looking to the Pacific Ocean and their proximity to it. So you can see how on the globe here, the Pacific Ocean is centered. Chile and Japan are each shaded in red, and it might be faint, but there's like a, a connected line that's connecting them. And this shows how, though labor from Japan or markets in Japan never became the scope that actors realized. There was this incredible visionary ambition that went into their work over the course of decades, and the actors themselves very much drew on the Pacific to describe themselves and Chile as a Pacific country. So it's not that I'm hoping Latin America in the Pacific will just be kind of a scholarly framing, but it's something that comes out of the historical actors themselves. So again, that might be an argument that doesn't sound profound, but hopefully will be interesting um, in my discipline. And uh, I think this, this image captures that. And uh, uh, I'm, ha I'm happy to chat more about it. And uh, thanks all for listening. Nice. Yeah. <laughs>